Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello and welcome back to the Forty Orty podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you very much for coming on, joining me and my lovely guest to talk about autism and concentration. Yes, autism does seem to have a lot of disadvantages in terms of the sensory aspects and the social aspects, but it also has a lot of strengths and advantages. My guest that I have today, Barry, is a very successful YouTuber and game producer. He's got a lot on his plate and he's got a lot of secrets to his abilities and um, strengths to share with us. But anyway, um, do you want to introduce yourself, Barry? Wow, that was a really good intro there, Tom. I do appreciate (laughs) that, my friend. Yes, he is absolutely correct. Um, I am known as Barry Aldridge and I have been on probably YouTube now for probably 12 years, I think, having like over 6,000 subscribers. And he is correct. I am actually a game producer, but a brand new one for sort of FMV games, which FMV stands for full motion video, which is kind of like interactive movie sort of stylized. And it could be like point and click and whatever sort of thing, Mm -hmm. working for all these different gaming, indie gaming companies. So they're independent games, which is a good thing where you have more creativity in that to your control. Um, also, just before we started, I did a thing for BBC Free, um, a short BBC, uh, BBC Free short thing of uh, about autism in general. And it was a short four or five minute video, which I had a lot of fun with. So much fun though doing it. And well, and also, yeah, I'm also a customer assistant at the Tesco's Express, where as we're recording this, as you can gather, we got COVID-19 situation as we, we're we actually recording are. it. <laughs> and it's just before Easter as well. Just for just give you a bit of a secret as well, just in case so if this comes out <laughs> after Easter. So, yeah, I'm probably going to be having my Easter eggs or finished off all my Easter eggs. I've got like five Easter eggs and they'll probably be down to zero as soon as this podcast comes out. <laughs> well, I can definitely uh, empathize with that. I've been giving up sweets and chocolate for Lent. Oh. I'm not religious. I'm not religious at all, but I just decided to have a little bit of a challenge to see whether I could um, not eat all that sugar and chocolate that I do on a regular basis. I did that once years ago, and I think when I was in my teens, and it was absolute hell for me, my friend, trust me. But I don't mind so much though nowadays, though, really, to tell you the truth, really. it's um, you, you definitely do have a lot, of, um, a lot of work on your plate. You do a lot of different things, and Mm. I mean, like, what what was it like to produce something at such a you know such a massive scale? Like with your BBC Three um, short, did you say that it had about two million views on it? Yeah, I, I, I think it was like three million. Yeah, it was three million, and um, uh, I was part of the video, and I came out with this brilliant line, which I forgot to mention before the podcast. I referenced Star Wars and, you know, we was talking about what autism was like. And I said, yeah, we're like the Rebel Alliance in Star Wars. And I said at the very end, come (laughs) on, bring on the lightsaber. (laughs) So, yeah, that's on there, guys. So trust me, um, it's a really, really good little video. Um, Some people say it's a little bit dated because of some of the references. But you know what? I had a fun time doing it. It even got aired on BBC One as well back at the end of 2017, and I got recognised a couple of times on the street for that. God, Whoa. yeah. Well, we well, I I definitely need to um, check that video out um, after we finished our little talk. Mm. Um, but that's really awesome. How did you get into the the sort of uh, YouTubing side of things? Like, what sort of sparked up your desire to put yourself on camera and talk to lots of people? Oh, that's a really good question, though, Tom. Um, What actually happened was I think my life was on a bit of a low at that point, and 
my best friend at the time, Aaron, if you're listening to this, oh, Aaron, hello to you. Um, he felt very, very sorry for me at that particular point. And he said, he showed me this YouTube website. And I, all I did at the time back then, though, is sort of the same as nowadays, but except though, it's okay though to do it where music artists put up their music videos or, you know, gameplay footage and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I thought, man, it's nice to watch. And then I started to watch other vloggers around about that time. Um, around about, it was 2006, 2007. I went, wow, cool. And then I started off with a channel called Barry83 2003, which I absolutely hate that name with real passion. <laughs> I really do. And then I was going through all this different stuff and I thought, hang on, everyone's using their code name. Nobody I know, apart from one or two people, were using their real name. So I thought, you know what? I'll go by my real name in the future. So at the, I think it was like November 21st, 2007, I decided though to use my real name and I came up with the real name, no gimmicks. I just did it as a laugh and it caught on there. And then, you know, I started to go to, back then was known as YouTube gatherings, which is now known as meetups. Mm -hmm. and it lifted from there and I got featured a few times on the YouTube front page before it all went corporate and all that sort of stuff. Well, that's just my opinion about before it all went corporate and it's all about money, business and that. But for me in general, YouTube experience has always been about community, making friends, meeting up with people, whenever you can do and, you know, having that social connection. And it mm -hmm. makes me wonder about what YouTube is though nowadays. I think it's still slightly there, but it isn't what it once was, but I still try every now and then to do a video whether like like we talked before whether it's a review a vlog maybe even the live stream because i've done a couple of live streams of a couple of games with a couple of companies i'm friends with because and they allowed me to do that because i got sent review codes and yeah so you you were there at the at really at the the start of youtube before it became such a massive you know part of people's lives yeah i would say <sighs> I'm just trying to think maybe a few months after it really got started. And then, you know, I was kind of there from the very beginning and that, and, you know, I remember watching a music, uh, uh, an interview with an old YouTube star from back in the day. And it talked about what happened to his career as well. And probably some people will probably know about it as well. So, and it was kind of interesting to see what actually happened to them. And that, you know, I think that YouTube fame sort of thing, I'm glad though it never caught onto my head a bit i'm just proud about what i've done at the moment though tom to be honest with you definitely i think you should be very proud of what you've done like you've you've got a lot of videos out there and and obviously you're very successful on the the game producing front mm. how did you get how did you get involved with game producing did you do a degree or did you teach yourself or did you know some people for me, it's more surprisingly, though, it's myself, really, because when I my university degree is, is in fact, multimedia. And just for people that want to know, we had a quick discussion about our degrees where, in certain reality, our degrees don't measure up to what we do in the near future, you know, in our lives. And mm -hmm. um, I, I'm a big fan of um, FMV games, which I did mention. And I saw, I saw this guy who was doing a Kickstarter and he had a producer credit for like, am I allowed to discount how much? It was only like a hundred pound, which is very, very cheap to be a producer. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to put my bet name in there. And I was like, oh no. But he was still accepting PayPal things. And this is my friend, Darren, Darren Hall from Teana Studios. And I said to him uh... for so many weeks, I'm going to get you the money to help produce the thing for you. I think he probably thought, nah, you know, that sort of thing. Then within two or three weeks, when I got a paycheck for my job at Tesco, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go for it. I just thought, why not? And then after that, another company calling themselves Super String. They had a Patreon sort of thing. And I liked mm -hmm. their ideas of their game for that, even though it got mixed reviews, but I liked the passion and the ideas behind it because this guy works for Square Enix. Used, works for Square Enix. He used to work with Sega. And a couple of other big gaming companies, and I thought, wow, I thought, why not? You know, better help him out in that. And he's got, he's got, he's got his next project coming out later on this year, and uh, he's got a side project that he's hoping to release very, very soon. By the time this podcast's out, the information of that will actually come out. So, and that was my friend jamming it off super string, really. So, yeah. Wow, cool. So, what what is it that you're currently working on right now? 
like the thing that you were um, working with. I think it's T- Tiana. Yeah, Tiana Studios. What it is, yeah, I just provide the money and I just let them get on with the project. And that at the end of the day, and I can fully trust them because he's got a couple of actors who's done an FMV for a game I really, really like and I became really, really good friends with. And, you know, every now and then I do ask him, like, can you share me any video or any pictures or something like that? And he does to a certain degree. Right? There may be certain times he can't share things because of contracts and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it, while it's a bit annoying, but I can understand the situation. And, you know, that's the point about making sure that everybody's cool now. If I feel like, yeah, he's done something wrong, I'd just say, hey, man, maybe pull back on this and that and the other. But the good thing is we we are both fans of Only Fools and Horses, and he's Del Boy <laughs> and I'm Rodney. And I we sometimes throw those type of jokes at each other every now and then. And that was and that's always fun, though, really. And so you got a good good relationship together. Yeah, definitely. A very, very good relationship. And um, he's I would like to help him out on his next project, definitely. And he he lives up in Yorkshire. I can't remember the place, but I'm all all I'm going to say is Yorkshire. He lives up in Yorkshire, and oh. I'm on the south coast of, and I'm on the south coast of England in West Sussex. But oh, I'm not going to so give any more in, information in just south. in case. Yeah, right on the south coast. Because I'm uh, I'm actually in in Yorkshire as well in North Yorkshire. No way. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, from different side of the country. <laughs> brilliant my friend brilliant do you not think it's it's crazy that um we're having a conversation in in two different rooms with two different mics all the way at the other side of the country from each other oh tell me about it mate and um i think that's the incredible thing about you know when you're doing a podcast or having a chat with people that you can be anywhere in the world and you could and it feels like yeah you're in the same room yeah 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 that's the beautiful <laughs> thing about it it's fantastic Awesome. Well, um, there was actually, there's a game that, that really comes, you know, like you were saying about how it was sort of like a point and click, more of a sort of movie-esque kind of game yeah. that, that, that was being made. Well, there's, there's this game that I really enjoyed. I actually watched a, a popular YouTuber play it, but it was, it was something like, um, it was about this, this girl who could sort of redo things redo things in time can't remember what the name oh of it is. i know what it is um is it called life is strange yes yeah 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 and here's another fact about that my friend jamming of super string he actually helped to promote that game with square enix whoa i know i absolutely I, I, love that game oh i absolutely love it as well and i'm not i'm not i'm not saying it as just to build a story i'm saying it as a fact he actually helped to market that particular game no question we? well that is definitely definitely something that definitely a game that i i really enjoyed and there's, there's there's not many sort of there's not there's not really many games out there that have such a compelling story to them i absolutely love that game it was i thought it was really great mm, definitely cool so today we're talking about autism in the workplace talking about like concentration the advantages and disadvantages of being in the the world that we live in and working in the world that we live in Mm -hmm. and being autistic yeah what do you believe what what are your experiences with being autistic in the workplace well i've had a lot of mixture of opinions about it like for a while i probably kept myself quiet and i found out you know during one of my jobs it wasn't very very helpful in the long run I just felt like, you know what, I could have spoken out a bit more about it because I was a bit worried, though. If I kept on talking about it, it will rub people the wrong way. And Mm -hmm. I don't want to rub people the wrong way at all. But I feel like, yeah, if you make a quick mention of it, then hopefully people will be understanding about it because back so many years ago, I think think it's probably since the 80s or maybe a bit before that, yeah, that autism has become – a bit more mainstream nowadays that you now got world autism awareness week autism awareness month world autism day Greta Thunberg yeah all these different things and that and sometimes the information can be misleading and sometimes Mm -hmm. it can be very very honest in that and um it is a bit more accepting nowadays 
that's what I've discovered. Definitely. And um, the great thing is, um, at my job at the moment with Tesco, before one of the managers had to leave because of a heart condition, um, he was very, very understanding about it. He wanted to learn more about it. And the same with other people as well. And and sometimes they can forget because we all got our, we all got our own minds about worrying about how we're going to get through the day with the job and all yeah, that sort yeah. of stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's how could I describe it? It's it's quite a lot to take in and all that sort of stuff. But also, I'm very very understanding about other people's needs as well. If it comes down to certain conditions or how they're feeling with the day, sometimes I may not be able to read people straight away, but I can find out. Yeah, maybe see how we go from there. So, do you have any uh, particular sort of? positive or, or negative experiences with either telling someone that you're autistic or you know either ha having a problem that's to do with some some autistic trait um well the great thing is i've kind of forgotten a lot of the negative aspects because i'm <laughs> someone here that tries to get rid of that stuff because one of the things about with the mainstream media is and i know this is going a little bit off topic here i feel like they're the, while they can be a bit too negative with their things and trust me about how they treat autism in general. Like they probably got some stuff down, but they haven't, they don't completely fully understand it. Yes. I remember mentioning to my manager one time about the noise factor and the same and that, and same with a couple of other managers and they were completely understand. They, they were wanting to help out. And I said, I could deal with this a lot of the time, but if it does get me down, I would probably need to be by myself in a room just to sit down and you know just have a quiet moment reflection in that mm -hmm. and one of my jobs luckily is doing bakery where i'm actually alone in a room at the moment which is kind of good as well but then also i have to go out on the shop floor to put the bakery out once it's out there and that so and do, do you find that in in terms of working on your youtube videos and um the sort of uh, game side of the stuff that you do do you find that there are any advantages to being autistic in the, in those kind of things? Yes. Um, it does give you a voice to voice your opinion about autism and that. And in the past, I did do some World Autism Awareness Day videos. And I thought, well, maybe I might only get a couple of people to help me out. Even people who ain't on the spectrum wanted to help me out because they knew a bit about my condition, but they just wanted to say what facts or whatever, and they wanted to help out. And it was absolutely was amazing. It really sent a tear down my eye. When I showed my dad the video, he was in hospital at the time and he, he doesn't normally cry too much. And I saw him crying and I was like, wow, I've done something really good here. From watching the video. Yeah. From watching the video I did like edit it together, put it all together. And it's probably mm -hmm. one of the proudest videos I ever made in that. View-wise, not strong, but... It means something. It means something. Exactly. Exactly, my friend. I definitely find that some sometimes the videos that I don't intend to be the most meaningful and impactful and I don't put as much effort into a certain video, it, all, it sometimes doesn't sort of line up with just how many views or, or how many how much attention it gets. It boggles me a little bit. Hmm that sometimes the views don't match up with just how much effort and meaning you put into a video. Yeah. And I guess that's one of the sort of negatives of, of YouTube in this, this current day and age. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I sort of agree with that. Definitely, mate. It's something uh, that gives me a bit more food for thought, I would say. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So... What do you believe are the main reasons why autistic individuals struggle within the workplace? What are the the, the main things about being autistic in in those situations that cause conflict or cause disagreements or cause difficulties with actually doing the job? Well, um, speaking again about with the Tesco job, I think it's just more about understanding your autistic nature because you know i think there are people that don't know about it or they don't know any family members or friends that actually have it and they think 
when they hear it for the first time, it's just like maybe someone just trying to say it just to get attention. Um, and then it does lead into conflict of kind of interest. But then when they hear about it, that it is actually a disability, more of a hidden disability, they go like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, yeah. But, you know, a lot of people have been very, very understanding. They don't, if they wanted to ask a question, I'll try and answer to the best I can. I tell them sometimes it may be a bit difficult to explain and all that sort of stuff. And it's just down to them at the end of the day, whether they want to listen or not, though, really. Um, but yeah, I, I always make sure to tell top brass and yeah, they always try and make it really, really understanding. And um, as long as, you know, you build a two way system with each other, then you got it in the bag, you know, as long as you make sure, yeah, you do your job, get on with it, that you know what it is. And also, if you don't understand, just ask again. And sometimes they'll make sure, yeah, that, uh, that you actually understand, make sure that you got the right essential. So sometimes when I'm on the job, um, they'll tell me the instructions. So they say, so I do this first and do that afterwards. And they go, yeah, yeah. So I have a bit of a better understanding, really, at the end of the day. So, so it's about about being communicative and bringing bringing things to the to the forefront that you think is important yes absolutely and you know that i'm fair with them that i make sure that i do the job that i can so then if say like yeah i have some issues with certain things they can actually pay attention at the end of the day mm-hmm. that, it's that sign of respect at the end of the day really that's brilliant mm, yeah a lot of autistic people that i talk to um mentioned that there there is a lot of difficulty with autism in the workplace and i think yeah it it does kind of depend on the 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 people around it's not all you know you're not in the same environment in in different jobs you know the people in certain areas of industries have different tend to have different personalities and outlooks and one of one of the things that is usually quite a, a problem in the workplace looking at the statistics is bullying and social exclusion in the workplace yeah yeah i do sort of see where you're coming from with that like i said you know some of my bad memories are kind of gone you know i make sure i don't focus on the bad stuff maybe a couple of times afterwards after a little bit but after that i just don't see those people again really to be honest with you or never ever focus on them really i think maybe it's something yeah that i was taught you know how to do normal stuff but also trying to adapt my autism in the process but hey, everyone on the autistic spectrum, and including anybody who's neurotypical, is that the word for yes, normals? Yeah. Normals. Yeah, neurotypical. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say normals, like normals, just to make it a bit easier. I, like yeah. I mean, you might get yeah. a little bit of flack in the uh, the old um, social justice division, but um, not on here. Oh, come on, the social justice thing. They, need, I think they need to wake up sometimes, seriously. <laughs> seriously. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I understand them being a bit offended, but at the same time, it's like, come on, guys. Word. You know, if you want, yeah, word up. Yeah, please just make sure. If we were rude to you, then I can understand you being offended. We're not being rude here. We're just trying to be honest. And that at the end of the day. But yeah, going back to the thing, um, I forgot what I was going to say about normals. <laughs> See, sorry. <laughs> those normals. Um, I know those normals. Um, the normals, well, I, shoot, I've completely forgotten. No, don't worry about it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, I think you get roughly the idea in that. But if anybody wants to ask me, you'll probably know from the, t- which I'll give the information at the very end. <laughs> you can ask you about some, some of the more personal aspects to it, I suppose. Yeah. My, um, my experiences obviously are very limited in the workplace because um, I, I only finished uni about a year ago, if, if, oh, wow. if that a year ago. And um, I think most of my sort of workplace experiences have been within school. So, yeah. for example, the, the initial sort of difficulties that I've had with working with other people have been during group projects that we've we'd had to do as part of modules oh yeah yeah i can remember certain stuff back at secondary school that happened to me but i was like yeah and it did happen with me at uni as well but i'll be honest with you again it's like uh water under the bridge Mm -hmm. in my view water under the bridge i'm like you know what if they want to see me again that's fine if not 
That's down to them at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. With that that instance in there was particular instance that I re- that I recall where we were doing this sort of uh, poster for um, I think we we were supposed to do a topic around uh, microbiology, so like about like the you know tiny sort of microscopic size organisms and mm. stuff, and it was my job to sort of put the the poster together because I did a little bit into IT and stuff and. The majority of the people in the group, so I, I could tell that they, they got on quite well. And it, because, because it was my, my job to do like the poster and stuff, and, and I've had a quite a bit of experience with it, I decided to sort of lay it out and, and, and do it. And there was this one person in that group that did not agree with so something like this, the font or the font size or something silly like that. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. I sort of, you know, relayed it back to, back to them and changed it around and stuff. And then at one point they said, like, I tell you what, I'm, I'm just going to do it. And obviously that left me with zero work to do because they were all sort of congregating and, and talking to each other and pretty much just completely ignoring me. And because of this one individual person who decided mm-hmm. that I wasn't fit for the job, um, one of them actually Ooh. asked me to go home. Like, just in a, in a normal conversational setting, asking me to go home. And at that time, my social skills were not developed to the standard that they are now. And I found, obviously, that very... not not I wouldn't say cruel, because it's not exactly the, the end of the world, but it's just... No. Those no. types of instances have occurred in many times in my life. And an, another instance... Um, that's quite clear in my mind is is going uh, to work in at Thailand, and um, so I did I did like a research project for a year in Thailand, did a bit of, bit of traveling mm. and stuff, and obviously the the understanding of autism and just general science is a little bit not lower but not not as strong in in either the public awareness or in the in the scientific literature. To, literature that they produce and i had yeah. a lot of problems with that i i, I mm. tried on many attempts to sort of explain how my brain works and try my best to be communicative and stuff but s- sadly they, they didn't really listen to me and um it ended up where i was a person who's never done proper formal research going into mm-hmm. a place that um, I need to do proper research and is going to become a research paper and be actual science with absolutely mm-hmm. no help at all. Yeah. And any time that I'd ask for help, it would be completely minimal, sometimes even incorrect. And then obviously when I approached my supervisor and asked if it was correct, it would be incorrect due to the, the information that they, these people are gave me. So they, they very much isolated themselves off me so so they sort of left me on my own and the the sad thing is is that these these individuals actually made very good friends with the rest of the students that came over to thailand with me and it was it was a very difficult situation as you can imagine yeah yeah i can imagine that mate yeah that those are the kind of workplace issues that i've had i think it's it's generally just that i don't think people are willfully willfully ignorant it's just that they don't some people don't really grasp just how different people can be yeah i can totally understand that though buddy and um i think what it is maybe they might have a bit of an understanding to it but they don't completely understand it's like maybe yeah they don't know any like i said they probably don't know anybody in their friends or family that actually understand it and yeah i think that's what i got from you telling me your story in thailand Mm -hmm. right there there's this um, uh, individual that I interviewed for my my documentary, my documentary Asperger's in Society, called uh, Peter Bainbridge, and he's sort of like the co-founder of this place called uh, Salford Autism, which is like yeah. a charity that goes and helps people, autistic people in the workplace, autistic people that have to sort of mediate, have to be mediated with like local authorities and stuff like that. And he says that the most problematic thing for people who are 
what you describe as novels <laughs> or neurotypicals. Yeah, that's it. In... Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, he would say that that in a lot of cases, the problem isn't that they don't have an awareness of it, but they just have such a broad, um, a broad understanding of autism that he de- he describes a very myopic, which is sort of having a, a very limited view that you know that they feel like they know everything about it and if you go against their preconceptions about how autism is supposed to be supposed to sort of occur in people then you know it's not your autism it's it's you that that seems to be the biggest problem from what from what i gathered from the interview that i had with him mm. and i think that's uh it, it it is a big issue for a lot of individuals yeah obviously you you seem to be quite good at sort of moving past stuff from what you've what you've been explaining you're very good at discarding the people who are going to be a nuisance who are not going to be helpful and going to lessen your your happiness yeah i would say a few years ago i would have had a struggle with that but as i've learned over the course of time i feel like now i can sort of move on a little bit i would be a bit upset for probably a day or two and then after that it would be Long term, I'll be like, yeah, move on. <laughs> I like that. I like that view. It's definitely something that I've grown increasingly towards over the the past few years as well. I think it's in it's important to realize the extent of which you you can make an effort and it not be reciprocated. That's when you gotta. Mm. That's when you gotta stop. It's not being reciprocated. Yeah. There's no, you know, there's no reason to continue. Yeah, you may be a gold medalist, my friend, but I could still teach you an odd trick here or there. <laughs> <laughs> well, which which tricks? I would like to hear one of those tricks. <laughs> like, you know, just teaching you right now about that, you know, you can get upset for a short thing, but if you can manage to deal with it in the long term and be calm long term, you'll be fine. Trust me. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's more of like a, would you say that you've, you're very much um, a stoicist? stoicist? Just trying to remember the meaning of the word. Sort of like, uh, maybe deal with what you can deal with, ignore and move on from what you can't deal with. Yeah, yeah, I think that is it. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it would be that meaning, but I just need to be sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so definitely, yeah, I definitely think having like that stoicist attitude towards life, particularly for an autistic person, can be quite helpful. So, is there a lot of lot of little sort of niggly issues that? occur during your life and sometimes it can just be quite quite good just to you know be able to move on from stuff and focus on things that are positive and and all that yes absolutely so um we talked a lot about about the sort of uh, issues and the the disadvantages and stuff and being autistic and the kind of problems that can occur are there any advantages that you believe that your autism gives to you if you can if you can think of it as a separate entity in terms of like i think some of the some of the common things are ability to concentrate out of box thinking yeah routine yeah straightforwardness yeah. yeah absolutely trying to keep to sort of like um thinking different things ahead that other people do try and think like two or three steps ahead like a psychological move having obsessions with certain like TV shows, films, even online series, um, having the knowledge about who did what or whatever. Um, sometimes with Doctor Who, I can remember who directed a certain story or who wrote it, who did the music, um, who actually came up with the idea for this particular line, say like the final line mm-hmm. of say like a series or who came out with this. And uh, yeah, and um, concentration again, can be sometimes a struggle but i make sure that i keep it in there make sure that everybody gets whatever they need focus on the end game Mm -hmm. as they would say as well so you'd say that a lot of sort of the the skills that you've um been using for your videos and and your work and stuff come from attention to detail would you say on things that you're interested in yes absolutely just to make sure that i get to the end game Get through the hardships, get through the hard times, because you know yeah that there are better days ahead <laughs> in the long term. 
even though I know, yeah, we're not immortal, but I know for a fact, yeah, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, as they would say. In terms of sort of like out of the box thinking, like, do you do you feel like in in comparison to to mo- to most individuals that you have a different way of interpreting things, a different way of explaining things? Would you say that that's that's an accolade for you? I would say that yes, because. You know, I might have a different idea about how we could actually get things done or try and think ahead. Like, if I noticed certain things were a bit short before someone else spotted it, I'll be like, yeah, we need to get this done and all that. And sometimes I don't need to say anything. I'll go, right, right, let me just go and get this thing unless they say, no, 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 don't do that. But, you know, if they notice that that I've been thinking ahead, they'll be like, yeah, well done, well done. And always (laughs) thinking ahead, though, really. That's a pretty good thing, though, really, at the end of the day, I can say. Definitely, it's, it's. I found that in general, I, I'm. I do. I do think think ahead, but my the thing that lends lends to me the most is concentration. In in my case, like mm. I can go for for days obsessing about a certain project. I've I've had times yeah. where I've you know stayed awake for about forty eight hours. Just Ooh. I know it's not good, but yeah, <laughs> you know, not eating. Uh, you know good good meals just you know grabbing something from the kitchen just to keep me going oh been there there. (laughs) there. Uh, you're not going to the toilet as much all that kind of stuff getting really into something there was this piece of scientific literature that i'd uh, read which sort of compared the the different persistence of thoughts between neurotypical people and autistic people and mm-hmm. for a neurotypical person, it takes takes around three seconds for them to sort of shift their mind onto something else. Whereas Ooh, three seconds. Mm-hmm, whereas with an autistic person, it's twenty seconds. So the the neuronal patterns and firing persists longer in autistic people. So it may it may be a s- sort of a factor in in how we just obsess about things and and just staying like um stay on working on projects you know through the night or through you know needing to go to the toilet (laughs) oh yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and i think also as well i think routine of being uh, being compelled to um stick to a routine can be helpful in some situations and i guess disadvantageous in some situations as well because mm, mm. once what one of one of the things that my my taekwondo coach sort of praised me on when i was training and stuff was that i was you know i stuck to the schedule like i stuck to i came every time to it to all of the sessions that i was that he wanted me to come to i did all of the exercises that he wanted me to do after or um on the off days of training mm-hmm. and he said that that the that was quite a sort of determining factor in in sort of my um, ability to fight and stuff. Um, mm. But then I suppose as well, which is I guess more of a recent topic, which is the whole the COVID thing. Yeah, yeah. I had a good routine, a good routine. I went to work. I wrote on the way to work. Did some work on the book that I'm working on. Ah. In the lunch times, I'd go out. I'd do a little sort of live stream video. Give some like auto autism related tips come back in finish work get on the bus do a bit of writing on the bus go to a coffee mm-hmm. shop do some more writing there then come up yeah <laughs> come home and work on some videos or go um go training or something and i had that solid routine that i'd been working on and i've been trying to solidify my head and now i can't do i can't do half of the things that were once on my routine and it's kind of like these past two weeks, I've had to wipe the slate clean and just sort of like start yeah. new, and that's yeah. been really difficult for me. I can, I can, I can understand that, mate. I mean, if it was me from a few years ago, I probably would be in the same boat as you. With me, yeah, with COVID nineteen, just going off a little bit here. Um, a few weeks ago, it was my birthday, and it was the last major outing. Oh, happy birthday! I w- yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Just for anybody who's wondering, I'm 37. So, yeah, I'm probably even nearly twice your age or something like that. Yeah, I'd say just a little bit over. 
just a little bit of a yeah. undo rather. <laughs> Yeah, so I went on a birthday trip to down to Southampton and I spent nearly all my money. So I was stuck between my workplace of Tesco, which is only around the corner from me, and my home. And I was like, oh, God. So I actually had some practice with self-isolation during that period. After my birthday back in February, um, I spent a lot of money and I didn't have much money. I was like, God, I only have to go to work around the corner. I could go to the next town on the train. But that was basically it. So I was like, oh, I'm stuck in the same area and all that for a sort of bit. When COVID-19 became serious and then the lockdown came down, I was like, oh, I've already done this for so many weeks. I know it's going to be a bit annoying, but all right, this is partly my life. And I found out, yeah, I can save a bit more money in that and do all this sort of stuff in that, which if if I was having a normal life, I wouldn't be able to do it so much. It would be a bit tricky. So you found that, that your actual, your routine hasn't really changed that much because of covid i would say slightly a little bit in the terms i can't go out because i would just go out just to clear my head or something like that Mm -hmm. but other than that it's not a major issue to be quite honest with which has surprised me a bit it was like i prepared myself and (laughs) same with my mum as well to be honest with you i suppose um there's there's been a lot of i follow a lot of autistic um instagrammers and (laughs) there's a lot of memes going out there about um you know uh neurotypicals in in before covid and after covid you know having complete oh, changes yeah, yeah. but now it's mm. it's an autistic world now you know with uh we stay away from people you have to keep a two meter distance you can't interact with people uh there's it's less busy less cars it's <laughs> Air's a lot more fresher yeah, as well. Yeah. You can even see a moon out. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, I tried to take the picture of the moon um, last night and oh God, it was like a blinking white light. Is it full moon? Or is it just, is it just um, a bit? It looked close to a full moon, but I can't really remember really, to be honest with you. So yeah, I'll have to, I have to check into that actually at some point. I have to check my picture again. And um, in ter- terms of routine again, like I think, I think the main changes in routine for me would be, it's obviously that now I'm, I've decided to sort of isolate with my girlfriend. Oh, lucky, lucky! Because a lot of people they can't seem to do that at the moment with their other halves, whether you know whatever whatever their sexual orientation is, they. They have a bit of trouble. They can only do online communication or phone or something mm-hmm. like that. So you are very, very lucky, my friend, which is a good thing. We were together before the lockdown occurred. How did she How did she feel about it? You don't mind me asking. No, you? definitely. I think um, she's finding it quite difficult in terms of not being able to go out and see friends and obviously yeah. not be able to even just, you know, go out, go out and sit on the park and have a little bit of a sunbathe and a breather and or just go go to the pub and get a meal you know it's 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 a very big change in the sort of recreational activities that you can do and i think the days Mm. for her sort of like blend into one it's very difficult sort of very your routine enough for it to not feel like it's just a never-ending cycle of days (laughs) if that makes sense i can see that Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could sort of see that. Is she um, neurotypical? Yes. Normie? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so, yeah, because I remember I had a discussion with one of my neurotypical friends, and she said to me, which kind of rubbed me the wrong way, she thought, yeah, it was best for me to find someone who is also autistic. And, uh, not that necessarily. We got into a... Not this. Yeah. It, it sort of rubbed me the wrong way. I think, yeah, she was trying to be honest with me to try and make me feel a bit happy. But at the same time, I think she didn't realize, yeah, that it actually affected me in that way that it's like, it's like saying, it's like pulling the race. Yeah, yeah, I know what you How mean. How do I say it? Mm-hmm. It's like pulling the race card or something like that on someone or the sex or the um, gender card or you whatever, you know what I'm saying? With people of your own making. Exactly, you know. exactly. Yeah. And that, a friend was trying to explain that to me. and I just sort of fought back against her afterwards and that, and I'm going to have a conversation with them again about it though one day to explain that whole situation like i know yeah you were trying to be honest with me and i do appreciate it and i know you were trying to be nice but it wasn't nice for me 
to be honest with you. So there are a lot of like positives and negatives to both autistic and neurotypical people. It just you know, mm. for example, I, I'm not very good with my executive functioning. I'm not very good at organizing and cleaning and. Oh uh, yeah, I'm with you. Yes, yeah. she's she's like a very big manager in a, in a social care company, and she's her head's on straight, and she's got everything organized and stuff. And mm. there are some benefits to that, of course. And then you know, with, with I suppose with an autistic partner, that you'd have a bit more of that unspoken sort of understanding, I guess, mm-hmm. with certain mm-hmm. issues, but. It's good. I, I I don't see see any problem with that. I don't think. I think if you if you enjoy being around someone and you you like them, then you should. That's just it, isn't it? I'm just clapping my hands just in case. <laughs> if you can't hear me, I'm just clapping my hands at the moment. <laughs> yep. So it's just in case. though, if anybody's wondering about what my reaction is, I thought oh, I'll just say I'm clapping my hands at the moment, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I love it. Okay. Right. Um. What about the main sort of negatives of being autistic in the workplace? Like the typical difficulty with social situations, possibly getting overwhelmed sensory-wise. In what cases do you feel like autism is is a negative and in what ways do you um, sort of work around that? For me, it's more about the overwhelming about how many jobs you've got to do, especially though when you're... Uh, when I'm a CA at Tesco, the Tesco's Express I'm working at, like you got to do this job, you got to do that job, make sure you get this done and all that. And then they suddenly change the job midstream and that. And um, it can be a bit overwhelming sometimes. And even trying to remember, you know, because I do bakery during weekend mornings, I'm just trying to remember, did I cook this? Did I cook that? Mm-hmm. And sometimes oh, I forget to cook something and I put it in the bag and I go like, oh God, I hadn't cooked that part. and <laughs> I'm selling it to a customer here, Jesus Christ. And especially around about this particular time where I've got to be extremely careful with the bakery, making sure that everything's all bagged in with it's all passes the protocol. It takes a little bit longer to do, but I feel more proud about doing it, you know, just to get it out there and that, you know, and get it out to the people really at the end of the day. And especially you know, around this period where it's going to be very, very busy over the Easter weekend and when I first discovered it many many years ago I was sent into a meltdown or something like that and after like probably a week or so I was like yeah time to move on from it really at the end of the day I definitely I definitely get the having lots of things I am I'm very much a person who likes to do one two maybe three at the max things in a day Mm -hmm. I can't as if it goes if it goes over to an extreme amount where I have to think about multiple things that are, g- are going to be happening, then it becomes very much like an overwhelming. It's like my brain doesn't know which which part of it to attribute energy to, and and even if I do have a plan, it still it still gets to gets to me. It's like I should start this, mm. but I need to start that and, and start this and. It, I struggle very much with that aspect of sort of attributing energy, even if I do have a set plan. I can't, I can't yeah. cope with too many things on my plate at the same time. It needs to be sectioned off, and it needs to be each thing needs to be given my full attention. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something yeah, where neurotypicals have a bit of trouble, like that we can't. You know, I can multitask, no question about it. But there are certain times that, you know, you may need to pull back mm-hmm. sometimes on the multitasking. I know, yeah, certain things are going to be done. Now, if it's an emergency and they tell me it's an emergency situation, I would be like, yeah, okay, yeah, I can manage yeah. that. But if it's like something like last minute and it is an emergency, I would probably go, what? Mm-hmm. And that's it, really. I think one of the one of the difficulties that sort of popped up in my mind, I mean, as I said before, I'm – sort of do special needs teaching assistance and stuff like that. And there was yeah. a class that I worked in that honestly I I absolutely adored every single child in that class and they were beautiful kids and mm-hmm. uh, I, d- I I missed I missed them a lot and I had a little bit of a a difficulty with m- the communication with the teacher 
Mm-hmm. I told the I told the school that I was autistic, and I told the members of the the team of the people that were working in that class that I was autistic. But the, the problem was is that they were they were asking me to do a lot of things that were sort of conflicting. Yeah. So it's it. I think I think another difficulty for me would be ambiguity, not not being able to give you a set plan, a set of things that you have to do. That aspect of it is difficult because they'd tell me things that I have to do and things that I should do, but then also say, well, if you feel like you should help out in this situation, then you should, which is a yeah. difficult one for me because it's like, where does the line, where, where do I draw the line? Like, mm-hmm. And my idea of where that line is to cross over into something else that I feel is more important is very different and very dependent on me. And their idea of it could be completely different to mine. And I think mm-hmm. that that is one of the sort of problems that I found very difficult, sort of ambiguity and not understanding just, just how much we, we need to be explained things in order to really get it into our heads or understand what they're trying to put across. I think that's, mm-hmm. that's a big sort of communicative issue that I've had in, in work, definitely. Mm-hmm. So I feel, I feel like once, once we have sort of a, a repertoire and, and, a, and a thing to work from and it's very concrete and there's a lot of explanation and detail, we do that extremely well. As soon as there's blank spaces, as soon as there's things that haven't been said, then it's a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's definitely one of the biggest things for me. So in terms of trying to work around these issues obviously like you've sort of uh, told me that you know basically the the stoic principle of sort of moving on with things and dealing with what you can Mm. do is a big part of your personality and how you navigate the world would you say Mm -hmm. yes i would say that definitely my friend it's just Sometimes, though, you just can't think about the small stuff, though, all the time. There are certain times, though, you can't win every battle. There are times, though, you're going to have to lose battles. It's like um, you're not, you're not going to win Olympic gold go all the time in practically everything, really, at the end of the day, even though if you really want to and that. But at the same time, I really still want to achieve it. It's very, very strange that the best way to success is actually learning from your failures. Yes. And the, the, everyone's going to fail whatever particular point. And I think that's a problem with though with nowadays. Like everyone feels like they want to win everything. Mm-hmm. And I think that's... Entitlement. Exactly. Exactly. It's like entitlement or something like that. I think if you earn it in the right way, then yes, the entitlement should come. But if you're just doing it and there's nothing out of it, then what's the point? really at the end of the day so it's going through those hardships going through those hard times even especially what you told me of what happened with thailand you had that hard time though in thailand Mm -hmm. and you've gotten better out of it by for example producing this podcast talking to various different people upon the autistic spectrum including yours truly here and (laughs) you learn from it at the end of the day which i'd say is a great achievement at the end of the day from a gold medalist learning from failures is a big part of the sport of taekwondo like you i've there's been countless uh, countless times where i've got my face beaten in <laughs> and i was trying to make it up to the big leagues <laughs> and even times in the big leagues where i got my face beaten in but there's also a lot of times where i passed through that that yeah. gate and grown and, and and got better and i think that whole sort of learning from failures, especially for an individual, um, can be extremely important. To see, see every failure as an opportunity to improve. I think that's a great thing. But in terms of looking at autism in the sort of broader sense, what do you, what do you think are the big problems that could be worked on? Some things that workplaces could put in place to help involve autistic people or make autistic people feel more comfortable and able to work in the workplace what would you say those things are 
Oh, this is a really good question. It, this could be quite a really broad, big question. I would say, you know, maybe bring in someone who actually knows about the condition. Like, even if it's someone who is a doctor or someone who knows about the diagnosis a bit, or maybe bringing in a guide or something like that from, say, like one of the autistic charities that know about mm -hmm. the condition or actually understand about the condition, you know, to every single workplace that, you know, even all the big corporations would have to, if they find out there's a certain condition, they got to try and study it and learn about it and trying to bring it all forward in that. And um, with the job I've got at the moment, they, we got these uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. laylards that have the sunflower thing on there, you know, a green back and, and I've got a couple of those, you know, and I always make sure to wear it around. And there's an interesting story. You know, when I was serving on the till, this was like, I think around about a month before the COVID-19 thing started. This lady, I think she was like 60 or 70 or something like that. And she asked me about, you got that nice Laylard. And I explained it to her and she asked me about my condition. I thought, you know what? Because she's been so nice. I, I explained it to her and I tried to explain the best I can. I said, I may not be the best at it, but she learned something from it as well. And um, I remember one time I felt a bit sad because there was someone who asked for the Laylards and we didn't have any more Laylards left at the end. So, and um, that was a good thing as well. Like something like that. Although I have heard some people didn't like the fact that Tesco actually put down their name on the Laylard. But to me, it's more of a positive that they're actually supporting those who have mm -hmm. hidden disabilities like autism, Down syndrome, and all that sort of stuff, you know at the end of the day definitely you know i, f I feel like that there's there's a problem i feel like a lot of the a lot of the policies and and, and initiatives workplaces are pushing seem seem to be a lot more on the sort of like superficial level so it, we had this this thing um in in the manchester student union where they'd banned clapping yeah yeah and that was in my, I think I was in my student union. They banned people from clapping. Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, I've heard about this. I've heard about this in the news, mate. And I'm, when I heard about this, I was like, are you flipping kidding me? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to control my swearing here, but I'm so close to actually swearing right now, Thank to be honest with you. Much. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it clean <laughs> for you, mate. Don't worry. I'm going to keep it clean. I don't want you to... Yeah, so I'm going to keep it clean. But what I can say is, are you flipping kidding with me when I first heard about that? And I was I was doing an apprenticeship at the time yeah. when that was going on. I think they wanted to do the jazz hands, which I find very, very funny. But at the same time, the clapping nature. I mean, I think it's more about there are autistic people who find the noise a bit distracting. I think I did a little bit as a kid, but it never bothered me after that little period. But yeah. I was like, are you kidding me when they said that? But you know what? I I sort of saw where it was coming from. But at the same time, I was like, um, PC stuff going over the top again, please, gentlemen. I do think it, 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 it does come from a good place and it does come from good intentions. But yeah. it's just completely not. It's, it's not the thing that people should be focusing on. It's, it's no reducing clapping in in a thing it's not revolutionary it's not about affecting the the pol the things around autism that matter yeah like for example employment and mental health support and bullying at school and all all of that stuff i think a lot of these these things that um most people believe that are the the main problems for for autistic people like the sensory stuff which yeah, I guess it, it, it is a large part of it, but it's 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 a very s small issue in comparison to all of the the problems that we need to tackle. Yeah, as I, as I said, with all the other stuff. Yeah, and I think w one of the ways that I believe workplaces can better integrate autistic people is to make sure that there is a positive there's a positive mindset and there's a there's a good level of understanding not just from like a symptomatic point of view and a scientific point of view but you know even if it's just having someone who 
talks about comes in and talks about their experiences with autism Mm -hmm. and allows people to sort of question them or even you know something like the something that i've come across such as the autism reality experience which is like this um very cool sort of van that goes around that sounds really weird Um, yeah 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 (laughs) come to my autumn reality experience there'll be a white van appearing over there um yeah (laughs) (laughs) Uh. but basically it simulates sensory overloads and it gets people to get to do tasks and stuff yeah yeah just think things like that like things like that that give people a bit of a an understanding a bit of a, a basis to work on or at least just the openness to listen to an autistic person rather than immediately pass judgment upon them for something that they may not have known was an issue. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Just that base level of understanding and integration, I think, is, is very important. And mm. I don't know whether that's something that needs to be done in the workplace. I suspect that it's something that needs to be done at all levels of society, secondary school, primary school. Yes, yeah, I was going to say that as well. It needs to be integrated a bit more into society. Um, also, I think um, maybe on a government level as well, because I feel like they're not doing enough to a certain degree or not. I think they've got a grasp of understanding it, though governments and politicians and that, but I feel like they're not 100% there, though, really. That's what I gathered from, you know, at the end of the day. But when most people think of autism, they think of it as something that takes away from your life, something that yeah. is a disability and is always a negative. Whereas there's yeah, a, l- a lot of people out there who don't believe that, and they be- they believe that a lot of the struggles that are occurring is is you know due to more of the the, the social model of disability in terms of integration and stuff. So. I definitely think that that you know autism does come with some negatives but also you know some positives but I feel like those there there is a unspoken sort of assumption that autism is the problem rather than yes. you know the other things like the bullying and the um the mental health and the you know, mm-hmm. unemployment is the problem yeah. it, it it seems to be autism's a problem not the things that autistic people experience. And I think that disconnect, it gets in the way. It gets in the way of progress and people learning about it. It's, it's a mm. really difficult thing to try and um, bring to people's attention because, you know, it's like someone comes yeah. along and it's like, well, they're autistic. Well, obviously they're going to have some disability. They're, they're disabled and they're going to have a lower quality of life. Not necessarily. Mm. No, absolutely not. <laughs> I think what it is, I think just people just want things simple, like a couple of paragraphs, that's it. But they don't realize, yeah, that it involves more than just a small text. It could be like a wealth of knowledge. It could be like a big 500-page book rather than a 10-page pamphlet Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. But also at the same time, yeah, you've got to make sure it's manageable for people so then they don't get bored. Like you say, it's a very, very difficult thing at the end of the day. I, I I definitely agree with that. Mm. Cool. So I think I've got through, we've got through some, um, pretty much all of the questions that I want to ask. Oh, wow. That's good. That's good. In terms of sort of a little summary, what three things do you think that with, with mentions um, are the most important to take away from this podcast? Oh, I'm just trying to remember now because... Again, like sometimes my concentration can go. I think for me, uh, it's more about trying to overcome certain issues if you can do. That's one thing I've kind of learned from it. Like if you've got the right mentality and you know what you're doing and you are told or you know what's going on and people have an understanding, then things are going to work out. That's one thing I can say. Uh, secondly, oh, this, 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 this is a little bit more hard than I thought, actually. (laughs) It's always the most difficult, difficult section. Yeah. Secondly, uh, for me, there can be a lot of negatives with autism and I can understand why people are a bit worried about this and the other, 
they have to understand that not everyone in the autistic spectrum are the same. And that concentration can be a bit up and down depending on it. Sometimes they can have the biggest gifts in the world. And I said that though in a BBC free video that I mentioned a bit earlier on. And I think that's the second thing, like make sure that you know that actually though, not every autistic person is the same. And it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing at the end of the day. And the third thing is, yeah, just having a laugh with this, to be honest with you, buddy. That's all it is at the end <laughs> of the day. That's all it is, really. Take the lighter side of life. Exactly. Exactly. I know that relates to point one, but in a way, yeah, it's kind of separate in its own way, really, at the end of the day. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that. We have cool. one last question, which is probably the most broad question of the, of the podcast. What does autism mean to you? Uniqueness, having a gift, being different from the rest of society, or, you know, to a certain portion of society, I would say. Being out there, maybe a bit, maybe a bit ignored sometimes, but to the right people, it can be the best gift in the world. Yeah. That's basically it, I can say, really, to be honest with you, my friend. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you. Cool. So um, would you like to uh, give out some of your social media links? Yes, yes. I've never, ever done this part before. Um, usually, I never, ever do, but I will do for you, though, my friend, because, you know, you <laughs> helped me out with this. So uh, my YouTube channel is, in fact, Barry Aldridge. Uh, my Twitter is also the exact same thing, Barry Aldridge. Instagram, it's Barry Aldridge 1983 as well. Um, for people wondering about the BBC Free short I took part in back in 2016, which was shared on BBC One back in 2017, I can remember the title of the video. It's called Things Not to Say to an Autistic Person. That's what the video is actually called. Um, for those wondering about the producing of the games and also the voiceover, which I've both briefly touched on, the producing roles are for Teyana Studios and the game is called The Dark Side of the Moon, which I'm hoping will be coming out during the summer or the autumn. And that was done by Darren. With the other producing thing with Superstring, um, before this actually comes out, I already know some certain things, but I can't tell any more information. He's hoping... My friend Jamin is hoping to release the game by the end of the year, maybe 2021, maybe at the latest. And the voiceover game, hopefully it will be out very, very soon. Who knows? Maybe after when this podcast has gone out, they'll probably have a release date or something like that or whatever. Exciting if it does, I will, pass, I will pass you on some details or whatever at some point. Because, you know, you know, one of the disadvantages with recording in advance, yeah, you could say some certain stuff and then you go, oh, right, it's coming out a bit sooner than you thought. Or <laughs> you got an exact date. I'm like, oh, God. You know, yeah, I, I almost you. swore again. I, I almost did blasphemy on here. So, like, you know, yeah, yeah, I almost came so close. I was like, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, I've got to keep it clean and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Just means that more people can hear it, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. That's what it is. And um, other than that, um, I'm also – doing some moderating business for a company called uh, a video game company called Wales Interactive. They're the ones who helped to publish a lot of FMV games and that really, really good company. And yeah, I think that's basically it. Unless I forgot anybody as well, anybody that's listening. If, if there is anything that you want to sort of, Put links or, or you want me to put any links in the description post sort of doing the interview, then we can, I can do that, definitely. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. I'll put all of those links in the, in the description of the YouTube video and also the podcast. So if anybody wants to visit any of Barry's links, check out some of the work that he's done, check out some of the, the games that he's helping produce, go check those out. I think it would be very interesting to have a look. And I... Definitely, we'll have to have a look as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely worth checking out, though, guys. If you if you can, that is, you know, and the the get the FMV games, they're not worth a lot of money. Probably between ten, fifteen pound. 
if you're listening outside the UK, it's, you have to find out through the dollar and you know all these different conversions of money. Really, at the end of the day, <laughs> it'll be different. I think it'll probably be like ten dollars, fifteen dollars if you're an American, or Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, euro. Probably probably twelve euros or twelve fifteen euros <laughs> at the end of the day. Barry, Barry, the uh, currency converter. <laughs> <laughs> well thank uh, you thank you very much for those links um obviously if you want to check out the 40 audio podcast on any different formats it's available on spotify apple podcasts and youtube those are the main places that you can go to there's a little bit there's a few more places that you can listen to it on um if you go to the anchor site for the 40 audio podcast You'll be able to find all the links to those things. In terms of videos, you can check out my YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth. I've got a lot of videos on YouTube and mental health and all that kind of stuff. And then also the social media, of course, at Asperger's Growth, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you have a story that you want to tell, if you've got any ideas or topics that you want to hear about, you can always send an email to aspergesgrowth at gmail.com. There is something also that I need to make aware to you guys. When this podcast come out has come out, it's likely that my, my documentary that I've been working on has, will be coming out as well. And I have spent an, in, an inordinate amount of time on this, trying to get it perfect with the low-quality equipment that, that I was given for my project. 200 to 300 hours presenting, produced, directed, all that stuff done by myself. Um, it's called Asperger's in Society, and I would be amazingly grateful. Amazingly grateful? I'd be really grateful if you went to uh, <laughs> check that out. But anyway, uh, did you enjoy the podcast, Barry? I did indeed, mate. I did indeed. Thank you. It's been um, a real pleasure just to do this with you. Now all I need now is my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> now where's my goddamn paycheck? <laughs> well, uh, this this uh, this podcast is is sadly not monetized. It's I'm not in the uh, US. I know, yeah, I know, I know. I, I was just I know messing. It's a joke. I know it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me I was going to say that. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I was going to say that for the very end. I was like, if you say bye, I'm going to say right. Where's my paycheck? Just leave it on a funny <laughs> note. <laughs> Well, thank you. It has been a pleasure to talk to you. And I feel in a lot more of a positive mood talking to you. So thank you very much for that. It's going to carry, no, thank you. carry with me to the end of the day. And I hope that other people will um, take on your positivity and stoicism in a uh, themselves, I suppose. Well, thank you as well, Tom. And I hope you and I hope everyone who is listening after Easter, we are actually, again, I thought I'd just mention recording it before Easter. I hope you had a great Easter and um, yeah, take care of yourself, guys. Thank you very much, peeps. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. See you later. Bye.